Like everyone else, he had to find a philosophy to justify the way that he lived. You see, if we do not live as we think, we soon begin to think as we live. That is why, to a great extent, the level of any civilization is the level of its womanhood. Because when man loves a woman, he has to be worthy of her. The higher she is in virtue, in nobility of character, truth and justice and goodness, the more a man has to aspire to be worthy of her. Now this library here is a simulation of my own study. And then at the far end is a door. And that door leads to the tabernacle, to the chapel. And I deliberately put my desk here in order that I may get my illumination from the Lord. And I cannot depend upon merits of my own, for I'm only too conscious of having failed the Son of God and all that I'm supposed to be. But I hope that when I go there for judgment, that I will hear from him these words. I heard my mother speak of you. About eight years ago, I was on a plane going from New York to Chicago. And as the plane took off, the stewardess sat down alongside of me. She was a ravishingly beautiful girl. Celibacy doesn't blind us, you know. I can look at the menu without ordering. She said, do you remember me? I said, no, I don't. I ought to, but I don't. Well, she said, two years ago on this plane, I sat with you for 20 minutes, and I remember every word you said. What did I say? Well, you began by saying you were a very beautiful girl. Did you know that of all the gifts that God gives, the one that he gets back last and least of all is the gift of beauty? He gives money and owners use it for the poor. Gives the gift of song and people sing for his glory. But too often when God gives beauty, he gets back nothing but a pile of old bones. So inasmuch as you are so exceptionally endowed, why don't you give your beauty to people who have never seen anything beautiful? That's what you said. Well, I said, that sounds just exactly like me. That's what I would say. <laughs> she said, I've had two years to think it over. And now I'm ready to do anything. When? Now. All right, you're going to a leper colony in Vietnam. So I sent her to a leper colony in Vietnam. And in one of her letters, she said, I do not know whether they ever think that they are looking at anything beautiful, but I know that I am the gratitude of these good people. What girl is there, for example, that would ever take a man who wrote out a wedding proposal? Glory be to God, if he loves the woman, he ought to be able to talk about her. We love God, we ought to be able to talk about him. And the final temptation, which will be the temptation of the church in the next 100 years. And we have the dim beginnings of it now. Satan says theology is politics. Why bother with theology? God, the transcendent, the mystery of redemption. The only thing that matters is politics. There are 10,000 times 10,000 roads down which any of you may travel for a lifetime. At the end of all of these roads, you are going to see two faces. Either the merciful face of Christ or the horrible face of Satan. And I wanted to go to Lord. And I said, well, if I have faith enough to go to Lord to celebrate the fifth anniversary of my ordination, it's up to the Blessed Mother to get me out. And I decided that if the Blessed Mother was going to pay my hotel bill, she could just as well pay a big one as a little one. <laughs> So I went to the best hotel in Lourdes. Six day I got my bill. I stuck it out because the novena was nine days of prayer. Waiting for the ninth day, I went down in the morning, nothing happened. The ninth noon, nothing happened. The ninth evening, nothing happened, and it was serious. So I thought I'd give the Blessed Mother another chance. <laughs> I went down to the grotto about half past ten. As I was saying the rosary, a portly gentleman tapped me on the shoulder. He said, are you an American priest? Yes. You speak French? Yes. You know Paris? Yes. Well, I'm... Mr. So-and-so of New York. And he said, we want you to come to Paris with us and uh, tomorrow and talk French for us. He said, have you paid your hotel bill yet? That was the most interesting question, question I ever had. <laughs> Fair then, instead of changing the will of God, actually places us in that environment which makes it possible for God to give us things that otherwise it would be impossible to give. People can't understand worship or praise. They said, what is God who wants praise? Is he a kind of a potentate sitting on a throne, 
very unhappy and miserable when we do not pay him some adulation. No, God does not need praise. We need it. And little girls about three and four years of age are going out into the garden and they're going to bring in from the garden bouquets and bunches of dandelions and they're going to give them to the mother. Does the mother need the dandelions? She doesn't need them. Does the child need to give them? Certainly. I wonder if husbands ever praise wives if they've been married for 18 years. Do you know that in 18 years your wife has prepared 19,710 meals? You will never attain a deep spiritual life without the scriptures. Read them in silence. Read them in the family. In silence we best discover God. And a beautiful example of that is in the case of Dr. Lesseur. And he married just an ordinarily good religious woman. And Dr. Lesseur was not only interested in medicine, he was also the editor of an atheistic uh, newspaper of Paris, to which he devoted most of his time. And in 1905, his wife was taken sick, and she said to her husband when she was dying, Felix, when I am dead, you will become a Dominican priest. He said, Elizabeth, you know my sentiments. I've sworn hatred of things religious. I shall live in atheism. I shall die in it. And she repeated her words and passed away. And then rummaging in her diary, he found her last will and testament. She said, in 1905, I asked Almighty God to send me sufficient sufferings to purchase your soul. And on the day that I die, I shall have paid the price. My goodness, my sufferings, my prayers will all have passed into you. Greater love than this no woman hath that she lay down her life for her husband. He went to Lourdes. He had written a book against it once. There he received the gift of faith in all of its fullness. And when he went to Rome, Benedict XV, and then the reigning pontiff, was told by Dr. Lesseur that he was going to become a Dominican priest. Well, in Lent, 1924, I made my retreat in the Dominican monastery in Belgium, where 45 minutes each time and four times a day, I made my retreat under and receive the spiritual direction of Father Lesseur, who told me this story. And I tell you that it's not often that you can make a retreat under a priest who will every now and then preface his remarks by saying, as my wife, Elizabeth, has said. <laughs> what surprises there will be on the last day when the awful people are coming to the kingdom of heaven. And if we get there, we're going to be surprised, first of all, because we're going to see a number of people there whom we never expected. And we'll say, how did he get in? <laughs> and then we're also going to be surprised to find that a number of people whom we expected to be there may not be there at all. But those surprises are mild. The third surprise will be the greatest of all, that we are there. The reason we do not think of angels is because we do not think of God. There may be a public library around the corner from you, but you do not use it, and therefore are not wise. There may be a Bible on your shelf, but you're not reading it, and therefore lacking spiritual inspiration. And there are angels near you to guide you and protect you, did you but invoke them. There's so much perversity attached to this so-called sex revolution, the glorification of homosexuality, unnatural crime. Since we're just animals, why not act like an animal? If we came from the beast, well, let's act like beasts. Animals mate only in season. Man doesn't. That's the first difference. And then secondly, let me say to you boys, you young men, say just animal, that's all. Purely biological, physiological. If that's so, why do you get mad at another boy who does the same thing to your sister? Why do you say she's my sister? If she's an animal, does that make any difference? Forgetting that he came primarily to die as a savior and to teach us how to be self-possessed, how to be men, how to resist the thing that drags us down, even to the beast. Just as soon as you try to get a Christ without a cross, to try to please everyone, then you have a sentimental, a romanticized Christ. But the one way to prevent a war is to make a war, and not a war against our enemies, but a war against ourselves. To unsheath a sword and unsheath it not against the enemy in hate, but to unsheathe it against ourselves and all that is base and vile. For it is well to remember that God hates peace in those who are destined for war. Any sinner 
is capable of being a great saint. And any saint is also capable of being a great sinner. The secret, therefore, of character development is the realization of this power that there is in each and every one of us for good and for evil. And the good Lord would have us lay hold of what is worst in ourselves. Do not think that people who have virtue and kindness and other great talents just came by these things naturally. They had to work at them very hard. You've often heard that Moses was meek. Yes, Scripture says he was the meekest man who ever lived, but Moses was not always meek. As a matter of fact, Moses once killed an Egyptian, and then after he was given the commandments, he came down and found his people adoring a brazen calf, and he smashed the tablets on a stone. He was the first one in the world to break all the commandments at once. God love you.